administration. Uh, but I love this quote by her. It's over 80% of the nervous system is involved in processing or organizing sensory input. And thus, the brain is primarily a sensory processing machine. So when we talk about this related to autism, up to 90% of autistic individuals experience some sort of sensory processing challenges, and they found this in the research. So that's a pretty, pretty big part of the community. Um, I'm currently doing my doctoral capstone project on autistic adults and the, the combination of sensory processing and interoception, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but it's, it's really fascinating how those two two systems are related. And then, as I mentioned, there are eight senses. Um, so just to kind of go through them, we know gustatory is our taste sense, olfactory is our smell, visual is us being able to see, auditory is of course our hearing, tactile is our touch system. And those are the ones we kind of think about on a regular basis as when we think about our senses, but these other ones are also just as important. So vestibular system, that's our, balance in our movement. Um, proprioception, this is a big one for me, uh, just because it is it is a sense that we can use to help us calm ourselves, but it's really our knowing our body awareness and kind of our location of where we are in space. And then interoception, which I mentioned a little bit earlier, is being able to pick up on kind of our internal body signals, so our inside sensory system. Um, I love this, uh, I think, again, because it just really emphasizes how important sensory processing is. Um, so this is called the pyramid of learning that they've kind of discovered back in the 90s. Um, so at the very bottom, the most you know important part piece of that is our central nervous system, right? But what you'll notice, the very next system up is our sensory systems. So, you know, we need our CNS, then we need our sensory systems to learn. And then everything above that is dependent on how our sensory systems are working. So in sensory motor development, we have, uh, sorry, it's not the greatest slide, body scheme, reflex maturation, postural security, ability to screen input, awareness of both sides of your body and planning. And then that next level up, which is perceptual motor development, that is things like um, auditory language skills, visual spatial perception, our attention center, uh, and then eye-hand coordination, ocular motor control, and postural adjustments. And then beyond that, depending on everything below it, is our cognitive intellect. So that's where we get academic learning, daily living activities, and behavior. So I think it's just really important that when we're talking about sensory processing, we're really understanding that it's at the base of what we need to do everything else. So there are a couple different types of sensory processing challenges. One that I think people are most familiar with would be sensory modulation. So that's being able to adjust or adapt to new sensory input. It can include our arousal level, our attention level, our emotions and self-regulation. So that's typically when I hear about sensory in the schools, it's a lot of times around sensory modulation. And typically that's what most of my clients are coming to me to in outpatient. Um, but there are though these other two parts that really do play into it. So sensory discrimination is being able to distinguish and organize sensory input. Um, so let me give you an example of that. Uh, so if you have auditory discrimination issues, you might have trouble knowing what words were said, being able to understand them, or like knowing where in the room they came from, where the sound is coming from. So then add that to if you have auditory sensitivity under sensory modulation, uh, you know, you can't figure out where a noise is coming from and it's a noise that's scaring you, like how much extra those kind of build on top of each other. So I kind of like to think about, you know, these other ones are important because they do impact modulation as well. And then praxis is the process that allows someone to interact with objects and their environment. So um, a lot of times we consider this motor planning and coordination. So it includes ideation. That means coming up with the idea for the motor plan, actually planning through the task, and then being able to go through and execute that motor task. Any, any questions yet? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so then let's look at what these actually look like in practice. So sensory modulation, this is where we might hear those terms seekers and avoiders, um, and they might have a low or high threshold for response. 
So tactile modulation, again, those are often our, our kids or adults that are very sensitive to light touch, uh, might have a really hard time finding clothing that they like. Um, it might react very severely just when someone lightly steps, walks by them and brushes them in line. Vestibular modulation, sometimes this can be the seekers that really are constantly in motion. They love to spin and spin and spin. Um, they are, you know, kind of those thrill seekers. Um, and you can have the opposite of that, right? Of uh, Because again, vestibular is our balance and, and movement. So those might also be people that are, you know, afraid of elevators or escalators or afraid to climb stairs or ladders. Uh, visual modulation, same thing. If you're a seeker, you're gonna be trying to get all of the visual input. You might be a really fast, you click through all the channels really fast because you like that constant kind of visual input. Or the opposite, an avoider is someone maybe that's light sensitive, um, you know, or, and wants to be in a dark, quiet place most of the time. And then auditory modulation, same thing. You might have those, those that are seekers. They might be making a lot of sounds uh, because they like a lot of sounds. They might need loud music to help them focus. And the opposite of that is going to be, you know, they need the noise canceling headphones or they might be making noise to cancel out all the other noise out around them that's bothering them. Okay, and then sensory discrimination problems look like um, with tactile, they might have poor awareness of where the clothing is on their body. They might not be able to find items in their pocket or their backpack uh, without actually being able to visually see them. Uh, can't button or engage a zipper without using their vision. Vestibular, these might be the kids that are falling out of their seats when leaning over. They have poor balance, especially when in motion, and, or they might not get dizzy. And then visual is difficulty locating an object in a room, uh, having letter reversals, challenges with matching color shapes and sizes, lining up numbers for a math problem, and judging distances. I have terrible visual discrimination issues. I can never find stuff on a shelf. Um, proprioception is excessive force or maybe too light a pressure with writing. So those are the kids that are like, you know, putting a hole in their paper they're writing or they're writing so light that you can't read it. Um, they might crash into people or furniture and they might even pet an animal with too much force. And then auditory is talking too loudly or too softly. Uh, trouble, trouble differentiating what noises to listen to and resulting in, eh, in res to resulting in ignoring a person speaking to them. So again, they're not sure what noises are important. So they, you think they're tuning you out, but they actually just can't tune in. And then our praxis problems look like, again, ideation is coming up with the idea. So difficulty with that, uh, coming up for an idea for movement or how to use objects. Motor planning is challenges with body awareness, planning and sequencing, and the ability to adjust to actions and objects. Bilateral coordination, using both sides of our body together, crossing midline and rotating at the trunk. And then projected action sequence. Um, so this one is difficulty with anticipating future events in your surrounding and the ability to adjust accordingly. So if you are playing tag and you see that the person you're going to target is right there, but then you can't plan for where they might go to next, that's what a difficulty with projected uh, action sequence is an would be an example of. Okay, um, so this next couple slides just talk about like where we might see kind of an age difference in sensory processing processing challenges. Um, so you know, often these are kiddos with those modulation issues that are in that constant state of fight, flight, or freeze, and this you know takes a toll not only on the child but the whole family, right? because um, the family is constantly trying to not elicit that response. Uh, autistic children want to engage with other kids, but sensory processing challenges can make it really intolerable for them, especially if they're at the opposite end. So if you have an avoider that's you know, trying to engage with a seeker, they kind of set each other off. Um, autistic children may be stigmatized as being a bad kid by those that don't understand or are unwilling to accommodate their sensory needs. And sensory processing challenges impact all areas of a child's life. So they include play, self-care, school, and community access. And then in adolescence, a 2016 study showed that when asked if autistic teens felt their sensory processing impacted their learning, 
hundred percent responded yes. And I think that's just like hugely significant. Um, so most cited a reduction in concentration um, and auditory differences were reported to be the most challenging. And then also this is where puberty's jumping in. Um, so remembering that interoception also involves uh, sexual drive. So some teens may need more stimulation in order to stay regulated. Um, and that can often, often come up as, you know, as adolescents, they're learning what is socially appropriate and what isn't. And then sensory differences can impact, uh, can impact dating, right? So, and I see this a lot with my adult clients. So considering not only the physical factors of dating, but the actual date itself. So depending on the location um, might lead to as well to sensory overload. So there's a lot going on um, kind of in that, in that time period where I don't think we always think about sensory as being impactful. And then in adulthood, research is showing there's a high correlation between anxiety and sensory processing differences in the adult autistic community. Um, so, and I feel like that makes so much sense, right? If you're constantly living your life in fight or flight, uh, of course you're gonna become anxious about it because um, that's been your whole experience growing up. So sensory processing differences persist in the areas of work, including challenges with noise, lighting, smells, and touch input. Um, think about the office and how it's designed very much, you know, it's well, especially older ones, uh, fluorescent lighting, uh, the open office design that has been a huge, huge fad in the last couple of years uh, is really not great for people with sensory issues. Uh, oftentimes I'll have my adult clients that were talking about work, the you know, they'll be like, I had to put a mirror on my desk because as people were coming up behind me, it would just throw me into like fight or flight all the time. Um, so just little things like that to kind of think about. And then serious relationships and marriages can also be impacted due to hypersensitivity to touch or the need to want more touch than what the other partner might be comfortable with. And then also just knowing this, that more people are receiving autism diagnoses in their adult years that were missed as children. So there's definitely, I'm getting a lot of adult clients that are coming to me in their 30s and 40s, and they just got an autism diagnosis for the first time. And I think some of the pandemic probably helped with that of like, people actually had time to kind of learn more about themselves and, and research stuff. And then I just wanted to talk a little bit about autism burnout because it's, I think something we're learning a little bit more about um, in the last couple of years. So it's a, a term described by the autistic community to describe a period of immense physical and mental fatigue. Um, so again, research shows that there's that the more a person needs to mask, the more likely they'll experience burnout. And then if you don't know what masking, it means like trying to kind of downplay um, and fit in with the general population. So like, you know, trying to hide your stimming if you need it, or, you know, trying to not use a sensory strategy if you need it. So it, it impacts an autistic person's ability to manage life skills, social interactions, and sensory input. So often you will see kind of those daily life skills um, regressing, but it's just, it's, it's because they don't have the capacity to do it due to the burnout. So skills regression often also can occur during this time. It's okay. And it's associated with life transitions and many report their first burnout experience happened during a transition from adolescence to adulthood. But that's kind of a big time. And, and Dora Raymaker, who's listed on there, she is a uh, researcher out of Portland State University. She's also autistic and has a ton of research around burnout. She's kind of the, the leader in that. Um, so real quick, these are just things that help with burnout. So more time with special interests and stimming, being able to self-advocate for one's own sensory needs, and then a lot of soothing sensory activities and a sensory diet. And how much time do I have left? Like 15 minutes? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and then sensory diets, which you probably heard this term before. I don't love it. I like to call it a sensory health plan, but it's really just coming up with a program of sensory activities that can help improve someone's ability to stay regulated throughout the day. Um, so these activities should be provided about every two hours and be easy to incorporate into one's routine. Uh, occupational therapists, we do specialize in helping develop these. Um, and we do that by kind of learning all about the person, their sensory profile, and then figuring out, according to that, what are the tools that would work best for them. A lot of it's 
very trial and error. Um, and then they might need to be adjusted as a person matures into different phases, phases of their life. Um, and then education for new relationships should also be occurring. So thinking about as they're going on to college, as they're going on to become an employee, those sorts of things. And then this is me just kind of talking about how great OTs are for sensory. So I'm gonna skip that one so we can get to the other stuff. Um, and then just so you guys know, there is, if you, uh, a, a Facebook page that I started for adults called Sensory Support with Adults with SPD, Sensory Processing Disorder. Um, there are, I think over a thousand people in it now. So that's always a great place if you have questions to go in there and ask. Um, and then this is just my references for this. And then the next part that I really wanna talk about because interoception, which we talked about that eight sense, has really been such a game changer in me working with my clients and learning how to address this part. Um, and I think it's a piece of sensory processing that we have missed for a very long time, but it's just starting to become uh, kind of, it's more kind of up and coming in the OT world is what I would say. So it is our eighth sense and it helps us read our internal body clues. So that can include our hunger and fullness, thirst, pain, body temperature, heart and breathing rate, social touch and muscle tension. And then beyond that, it also can include things like itch, nausea, sleepiness, tickle, physical exertion, um, social, social touch. And then this is a big one too that I see a lot in being able to recognize when you need to use the bathroom. So it actually came around a long time ago by Sir Charles Sherrington. He was a Nobel Prize winning doctor and he described it as the feelings we get from our internal organs. It remained mostly unknown for about 90 years. And then another neuroscientist, A.D. Craig, published new research. And it's from Craig's work that the, I think it's really started to kick off a lot more. Um, so he discovered that there are pathways that lead from tissues and organs to the body, to the spinal cord, to specific parts of the brain. And he found that interoception is much more than just not only the feelings of our organs, but it's also responsible for the entire condition of our inner body. So it includes temperature, pain, and itch. So in our brain, we have this part called the insula. Uh, so the insular cortex, it's the part of the brain that receives the most interoceptive information. Um, and it uses information from our heart, bladder, and stomach and translates that data into a message that makes sense to us on a conscious level. It also includes emotional states such as fear, anxiety, happiness, excitement, and frustration. So the insula really helps us interpret how do we feel. So think about that as if we were, if we're feeling anxious, where might we feel it in our body? Anybody? You might feel it in your gut. Uh huh. Yeah, I'm probably breaking out into hives, which I always do when I present, but that's another piece. I feel hot. My skin feels hot. I might have tight muscles, right? So it's getting to pick up on all those clues about what our emotion would be. And for a lot of people that have sensory issues, especially interoception related, they can't pick up on that or they might not pick up on it until the signal is very big. Okay. And so uh, with interoception and autism, the research shows there's a really significant difference between the insula and the autistic population and those who are, who are not. But like I said, I'm seeing this connection with most of my sensory clients as they have also have some interoception uh, differences. And so connectivity within the subdivisions of the insula and between the insula and other parts of the brain showed a low connectivity of the mid and posterior insula in both adolescents and adults with ASD. And so in young children with ASD, the studies have shown a hyperconnectivity. I would say take all of these studies with a grain of salt because there isn't as someone who's doing my research project on this right now, there the research is so varied and it's often because the amount of participants in the study are like under 25. Um, so we're, we haven't had a really great large research study on interoception and autism yet. Um, hopefully that comes sooner rather than later, but there's really not, and there's really hasn't been a lot of like randomized control studies on it yet. Um, okay, so this suggests a shift might occur from childhood to adolescence and adults with autism. Um, and then there, again, they showed a structural difference in the insula. So there was kind of a reduced gray matter volume uh, in autistic individuals. 
So this next one is just gonna, we're gonna take a piece of interoception, our sense of thirst. So how do we know when we are thirsty? We feel the sensation. So what does our mouth feel like? I feel like thirsty right now. So you might have a dry throat or dry mouth. You might have that cotton mouth, right? Might get hard to talk. Our body then figures out what state it is in or the emotion. So, and I always call for thirsty, that's called a homeostatic emotion. So it's, again, it's kind of related to what our body's doing, but it also includes our big, big emotions and feelings. So our body figures out, hey, I'm thirsty. Then we get the urge to act, hopefully. So then we would go take the action, which would be getting a drink of water. And then our outcome would be, we would no longer have that dry throat and we would feel more comfortable. So oftentimes it's just picking up those uncomfortable signals in our body and being able to, to respond to them and then make ourselves feel better. So if we have poor inter interoceptive awareness of thirst, we're in A, maybe not gonna feel the sensation of feeling thirsty at all. And our body doesn't figure out that its current state or emotion is that we're thirsty. We don't get the urge to act, so we don't drink the water. So at least in action. And then the consequence is our body becomes more uncomfortable and can eventually lead to dehydration, right? So beyond this, dehydration can impact our emotional state, energy and focus can lead to things like heat exhaustion and poor kidney health. So it can really, not picking up on some of these things can really further down the line impact our physical health. And then this is just a slide talking about what does an emotion feel like? So what does sad feel like? Where you, what are some body signals you get for sad? You might get crying eyes, right? Um, a lot of times people will tell me a feeling of pressure on their chest, um, you probably be crying. Um, anxious, we talked about already. And then what does excitement feel like? So. Uh, it might be really hard to sit still when we're excited. We might kind of be talking faster, or have a faster voice, a louder voice, uh, might be more, have more of an expression on our face. And we might feel our heartbeat and our breathing increase too. Oh, there we go. So, and you know, you know, kind of those classic things of butterflies and stomach jittery. Okay, so problems with interoception look like waiting until the last minute to use the bathroom. Anybody have kids or family members that do that. Um, maybe always feeling hungry or always thirsty. Uh, panicking after a brief time of physical exertion. So again, maybe they're not uh, that feeling of a really ha fast heartbeat or fast breathing um, feels overly uncomfortable to them. So then they, that causes them to feel panicked. Uh, frequent trips to the nurse's office at school with complaints of aches and pains because they're feeling pain more than others. Um, insistence that they are feeling okay even when they are visibly angry. Poor flexibility and control of emotions. High rates of depression and poor self-esteem, right? If you can't trust your, what your own body signals are trying to tell you, um, you can only imagine how that would impact your self-esteem. And then also poor empathy. So research shows that interoception can be improved with two types of interventions. Um, so that's kind of adaptations and modifications for reduced interoceptive awareness. Um, and I'll show you some examples of those in slides coming up. And then what we call interoceptive awareness or um, in the therapy world, it's called IA for short, building activity. So increasing your awareness of body signals and, and what they're trying to tell you. So here are just some examples of adaptations for reduced interoceptive awareness, um, oftentimes visual support. So the one on the left is um, a thermometer, but it has actually like what type of clothes you should be wearing for that temperature. Because a lot of times uh, people with low IA don't realize, oh, it's cold outside, I should be wearing pants and maybe a jacket. So this is just a visual to help them remember that. Um, and that can also go along with tactile sensitivities too, right? Of like, I don't like the way shorts feel on my my legs or short sleeve shirts. So I'm gonna wear sweatshirts and long sweatpants in the middle of the summer because it's uncomfortable for me. Um, and then this is a rehydration chart. So again, just a visual support of like, if your urine is this color, you need to be drinking more water. 
Uh, another great one for hydration is just uh, the water bottles that exist out there that say, by this time, you should drink this much water and kind of go down. Those are great ones for that. Um, and then adaptations for reduced interoceptive awareness, uh, some social narratives. This is a great book for kids. It's called Listening to My Body. Um, and it goes into really good detail about interoceptive awareness, what body signals are, and how they can impact emotions. So it's kind of all related to self-regulation. It's my favorite book. I use it with all my young clients the, the first time we work together. And then interoceptive awareness builders. So um, these are mind, body checks and scans. So just sitting out and actually thinking like, how many body signals can I name right now uh, for this activity? You'll see over there on the table, I have a card that has a bunch of different body parts and like different words that describe different feelings. So I'll use that a lot with the body checks and scans to help them, to give them a word. Cause sometimes you don't know, like, wait, how are my eyes feeling right now? But when you have a kind of a list to go through, it helps a little bit. Uh, mindfulness activities are a big one. And then emotional regulation and emotion identification. And those and really kind of all go work together. Like you don't wanna just do one, you really wanna be working on all of them. So this is an example of a body check scan. Um, this one is just a great one for anxiety because um, everyone feels anxiety very differently. Um, so this one, I love to sit down when we're talking about doing a full body scan and how they relate to anxiety and like do it with someone and be like, well, this is what it feels like in my body, but look, does it feel like that for you? Uh, and it's kind of fun just to be able to compare and contrast because there's no, uh, especially with interoception, there's no, there's no right way to have a feeling. You really have to, um, whatever the personal's inner experience is, you have to go by what they're telling you. Uh, because you, like I said, you may not break out into rash when you're public speaking, but I definitely do. Um, so you have to kind of just uh, acknowledge and honor what the person is telling you. And then mindfulness activities. So this is just an example of a census scavenger hunt. Um, I, I The curriculum I use is adopted by Kelly Mahler, uh, who's an occupational therapist that is kind of uh, on the cutting edge of mindfulness. Um, and so she really does like a lesson a week. So the first week it's hands. So there's a bunch of different experience for ways your hands can feel and they have to go through the experiments and feel them. But you can really break it down into very simplistic uh, mindfulness activities that can then help that person be able to clue into their body a little bit more. And then this one is, um, this is on Teachers Pay Teachers. It's a, called a daily check-in. I love to do this with all my clients at the beginning of the session. Uh, so it has different things like sleep. Uh, you know, how are you feeling sleep-wise today? And, you know, I learned so much from some of the kids I work with that I wouldn't have known otherwise. They're like, I only slept like three hours last night. I kept waking up. So now I know, okay, I'm not going to push this hard today because I've had this as our check-in to begin with. Or, you know, I haven't eaten for like six hours. I'm starving. <laughs> okay, let's get a snack before I, again, ask you to be working on emotional regulation. The next part, again, is just a quick body check. I don't love how I all this is put together, but it gives me enough to go on. And then the backside is feelings check-in. Um, if you do the zones, you can do the zones. And then tools they can use. So they can write down a couple different, um, you know, calming or self-regulation strategies to use. And then this um, is, again, taken from Kelly Muller's book. Uh, but these are people that she worked with that had interoception differences. So, and they really are the experts. Um, so Chloe Rothschild, who's 23, she said, Difficult, difficulties with interoception help to explain why I have such a hard time identifying my exact symptoms when I am sick, why sometimes I can't eat, I can eat snack after snack without feeling full, and why I get upset so quickly because I don't feel it until I'm already far into the storm of the discomfort and frustration. And then Gracie, a 13-year-old autistic girl, said a lot of times the inside of my body feels like one of those glitter timers, the ones that you can shake and the glitter goes every which way. I feel so many different things at once and I'm not sure what is important. It is very overwhelming. And then Nick, who's the father of a four, his 14 year old autistic son said, my son walked around on a broken leg for two days without a single complaint or indication of pain. It wasn't until I noticed the swelling and bruising that I realized he had a serious injury. Um, 
And I can tell you, one of my adult clients, uh, as how sensory and interoception are related, was like, I don't like the feeling of full, right? So she's literally had a hard time getting enough nutrients in her body because she doesn't like that fullness feeling. And so what we figured out together is because when you're full, what happens to the clothing on your body, right? So if you're already tactilely sensitive and you have that happen, uh, then that feeling of fullness then initiates a tactile, uh, tactile issues. So we have been playing around with her wearing a dress when she eats meals. Um, that's, you know, again, just kind of a free flowing dress. And that has made a huge difference in her ability to increase her intake for food. Um, so I don't know. It was just, that's kind of like one of the cool things I think about thinking about these two systems together and how they interact and how, and how they do impact each other. So that's all I had for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay so um there is a little overlap um so uh, so just to keep that in mind so um so i called or i titled my presentation sensory processing in action education and participation and the many layers so um, so before we kind of dive into sensory processing, I kind of wanted to briefly just kind of talk about um, um, our neurology and how it kind of, um, and specifically our nervous system and how it helps us maintain safety and our body system. So Diane kind of talked, touched about it, touched on it, but um, but but our we have a central nervous system, which is our brain and our spinal cord, and then we have a peripheral system, which is our somatics or voluntary movements, and our autonomic um, nervous system. So that's what we're going to kind of focus on a little bit because it's kind of like I put in my title. It's just one of the layers kind of embedded in this. Um, so the nervous system or the autonomic nervous system. So we have the parasympathetic, which is our rest and digest. So this is, you know, when we're relaxed, you know, taking it in, we can take in information, we can learn new things, we can kind of, we're in a good state, right? And then we have our sympathetic nervous system, which is our fight or flight. Um, and also just like get out of Dodge, no time for the bathroom, you're not eating that sandwich, bye-bye, the house is on fire, right? Um, and so this all kind of plays into, again, um, if how our body, if we are processing sensory that kind of puts us into that more sympathetic nervous system, this is how our body's kind of feeling. And, and where do we need to stay to have that rest and digest and that learning? So I just kind of wanted to touch on that before. Um, another thing before we dive into sensory processing too, is I just kind of like to think um, in pictures, right? So this is a scene from, it looks like a big city, maybe New York. Um, and then just thinking about it from all the sensory that you're taking in during this. So just like, um, and this is all very individual. So when I think about this, I'm like, oh my gosh, like a lot sense, you know, overwhelming uh, sounds and um, smells and lights and all of it. It's a lot, right? Um, and then think about the task of walking across the street in New York City, right? How you have to um, act on getting across the street safely, like all the, the the processing and all that integration of all those different senses so that you can safely get across that street without running into the person coming at you, you know, crossing the street, a car, the lights flashing, like all of that is a lot, right? Um, so then on the contrast, you know, here's another scene that I kind of like, this reminds me of when I was a kid, um, but also the same thing all the different senses. So it's definitely seems calmer, the, the, the colors, it's like more muted. Um, you know, the smells are different. You probably, again, that task of walking across the street, I mean, you might not even have to look, you could probably hear if a car was coming, um, you know, but then look at that bank. There's kind of that challenge of like, oh, you have to plan. How are you going to get up that bank if you're wearing like high heels or something? So there's still like a planning kind of going into this. And honestly, both these these scenarios are very different and individual. To me, like New York City, I'm like, it's a lot. It's exhausting. I don't want to be there. But as we'll kind of talk when we talk about different sensory uh, processors, it could be something somebody really likes. So 
Um, okay, so sensory processing um, and students and SPED. So like I kind of talked about, we all have our own sensory processing preferences and unique kind of um, profiles. I always kind of joke that people that um, are extreme marathoners are, are really just, they figured out how to cope with a need to like get that input, right? Or extreme sports. They are just, they've just figured out a way that's taking care of a need. Um, and then sensory processing differences. So 5% of the general population have sensory processing differences. Um, people with ADHD, 40% are reported to have sensory processing differences. Autism, 95%. So this kind of goes to what Diane was talking about, just that autism burnout. If you think about um, that and having to experience that, that, that can lead to kind of that um, idea of sensory uh, or, yeah. Uh, autism burnout. Um, and then I just kind of like to think about just even some other population that we see in school, like cerebral palsy, you know, that's a motor, you know, motor um, challenges. And then trauma can also kind of play into also looking at sensory processing if, if you experience process, uh, trauma. Um, okay, so I kind of broke it down in this like umbrella. Diane kind of also, she had a um, a visual of this as well. Um, and I start and I put a big eyeball because just like Diane said, this is what we kind of talk about the most is the sensory modulation part of that umbrella. Cause this is something that a lot of times people can see. They can see, um, when somebody's a seeker, right. Cause they're like the ones that are running or bouncing or whatever. Um, you can see if somebody's over responsive because they're like holding, their ears, you know, or they're saying too loud, too loud. Um, under responsive, I feel like are the, are the kind of, are not usually brought to our attention so much. We kind of usually see them and we're like, Hey, what about that student? But they're kind of sometimes the student that's like laying on the table or, um, the teacher says they don't listen to me. They ignore me. Right. Because they might need, um, more input to register some of that. So, um, so I kind of wanted to put this in there because a lot of times, you know, as an OT in the school, I get like, oh, we, I need sense, you know, we need all these sensory tools, um, they're sensory seeking, but they can also be a lot of different things. So it could be somebody that's over responsive actually, um, but maybe they're avoiding an input or they're coping with stress. So that appears that they're sensory seeking, but maybe they're actually, um, over responsive. Um, or they're under responsive, so they're trying to keep themselves alert. So again, they're they're appearing like they're they're needing more and more, but maybe they're trying to stay um, aroused. Um, craving, so again, they may be seeking more and more input, but it's also causing them to be more disport, uh, disorganized. Um, postural challenges. I've seen this before where, you know, it's like they're wiggling in their seat, they're all over the place. And then I see a teacher put a wiggle seat on, but it's like, whoa, whoa, like they're actually are having a hard time figuring out where their body is in space and like kind of keeping their posture. So they're kind of all over the place. Um, dyspraxia. So this is that motor um, planning challenge. Um, so they also they're, they might be trying, it might look like sensory seeking, but they're trying to figure out how to make a plan, to execute a plan, to start a plan. Um, and then that discrimination of trying to, um, you know, again, uh, you know, putting too much pressure on a pencil or too little. So they're, they might be look like, oh, they're squeezing something so hard, they're needing that sensory or they're chewing something, but they're trying to get more information because maybe they're they're not able to kind of differentiate between um, the input that they are receiving. So, so we just have to keep in mind and be careful when applying these sensory techniques. So, um, so sensory modulation approaches. So if you have your over responder, so somebody that's like sensitive, um, we would approach it like, low and slow. So we're not going to put them on a swing and um, like if they're over responsive to vestibular input, maybe low and slow, we're not going to put them in fast movement. Um, we really want to model it because this is again where if their body is not, re um, is overreacting, then we're putting them into kind of that, that neurological kind of fight or flight. And so we really want to kind of 
model um, model and, and get their trust and not surprise or force anything on them and, and really make sure that the student has control over everything. These are the students that really do like that predictable routine so that they aren't put into this uncomfortable kind of fight or flight. Um, and then just calming activities. And then under responders, respond under responders um, need that fast blast activity or very alerting. Um, so this is where like, again, like I feel like we don't usually get consulted as an OTs on this as much, but this would be like where, you know, some of those, those, you know, quick burst where, okay, you're going to jump up, touch your toes, take a drink of water, and you're going to get back to work. Kind of that would be something fast blast movements um, combined with that sensory input. So um, again, if the student is under responsive to auditory inputs, right, the teacher's talking, she's saying, do something, you know, follow a just direct direction, but the student doesn't do anything. Um, the teacher might think, oh, they aren't listening to me instead of like combining input. So maybe they need the teacher to come over, tap, okay, and then maybe provide a step by step or a visual that they can come to. So it's kind of combining those inputs of auditory, visual, um, tactile, um, and then just functional task and then giving them high affect so that they can really read like those exact, you know, what. Um, they can read some of those cues. And then uh, seekers, uh, you know, this is where I think giving hard end task or very functional activity, classroom task, okay, you're going to stack stack the chair. So it's like kind of they're getting that input, that movement, but then it's a hard end task or, you know, wiping the board. Um, but yeah, functional activities, beginning and end. Um, someone said, my kid has the inability to tell if they're hot. We get thirsty, but he won't drink when reminded. This leads to dehydration and then headaches and emotional dysregulation. Everything is so interconnected. Besides visual reminders, what suggestions do you have for including an effective portion that these? Mm -hmm. well, I like the idea of just like the, the water bottle mm -hmm. idea. Um, I've seen like water bottles that also kind of have a timer, so you have to like drink. It like will like light up or something when you have to drink. Um, and I like electrolytes too with water because it gives the water some flavor. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes it's still, you know, some do, but some need like that little extra mm -hmm. kind of yeah. flavor like, and motivation to drink at that mm -hmm. time. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think also just education on like this is what happens in your body. Water, right? Yeah, I, I definitely think that sometimes like we don't give enough of that, like the why, mm -hmm. um, because it's that coping skill that we want. You know, we don't sometimes always want to put a bandaid on it. We want to teach the why because we all are we we are we're coping with how to sometimes deal. With, and if we don't give them the why and that coping, then it's like we're just putting a bandaid on it, kind of. So, I, I yeah, it. Okay. yeah. I think the biggest one for me with this is uh, why do we always tell kids when they're upset or angry? Take a deep breath. But we never tell them why. We never tell them that because when you're angry and upset, most likely your heart is beating faster. And so to take slow deep breaths will calm your heart rate down. And then, you know, it'll be, you, you know, you'll be more ready. We just tell them, take a deep breath. And be like, I don't know about you guys, but I have the hardest yeah. time not doing that. In the, in the moment, right? But with, with that knowledge and some muscle memory practice, then it does, you know, kind of help to understand. But absolutely, I think you're right. We, we need to explain the why. We need to go Yeah, totally. Um, Okay, so I brought this slide back too, just because I was like, I just wanted us to think about this too. If we have somebody that's an over responsive, how this would be a really challenging experience walking across, you know, the street, um, trying to integrate all of that uh, input, um, or an under response or responsive person. This actually might be something that they live for, like, um, you know, getting all that input because then they can be like, oh, like, you know, like just here, you know, getting that deep. Kind of input. I had an assembly a couple of weeks ago. It was a Japanese drum crew that came, and I was just fascinated seeing some of my students um, with sensory processing uh, difficulties just um, just really embracing this because you could physically feel the drum, and it was just so loud, and like they, it, it was just really fascinating. So this could be something that 
under responsive, you know, love New York City, not me. I'm like, no, thank you. But um, yeah, so just something I just wanted to kind of think about those. Um, what does this regulation look like? I think we can kind of all probably know what this looks like, but it could be extreme silly, running around, difficulties transitioning, aggression, low tolerance to activities, easily frustrated, shut down, um, you know, full tantrum response, that fight, that flight or freeze, and then just like physical signs like uh, fisted hands, glaring, darting eyes, you know, and some of this could be also, um, in response to the interoception, you know, how can we kind of embed a little bit more of that coping strategies so that, um, cause I, when I read Ke uh, Kelly Molnar, one thing that kind of struck me when we were, she was talking to, to autistic voices, one was like, I didn't know I was mad until I punched the wall. So it's kind of like that, that was like when it got so big. So even just like physical signs of like, maybe that's, when we need to start looking at interoception and coping strategies and yeah so. um supporting sensory modulation and discrimination difficulties in school um so this is where um i i really you know knowing kind of where they maybe fit in that modulation bucket of like under over seeker you know i think that meaningful movement breaks um, can be really important. It's kind of like that sensory diet or sensory lifestyle, which you call it. I like the sensory health, health panel, which I totally like. I like that a lot better too. Um, um, and I think that sometimes we have to be cautious in the school that like all, not all movement is the same. Um, I've definitely, um, starting to educate more and more about like go noodle does not mean that, like that is movement break that can be very dysregulating especially to when we go back and look at that umbrella we have the the motor um difficulties within that sensory piece so you know and also just that just right of like if they're un over responsive sure give them some of that like quick movements but if they're under responsive um maybe we need to give them like some more mindful movement or yoga and kind of connect it more to your body versus kind of uh music video dancing so um so also i like the coping strategies i think is huge um deep breathing but and explaining why deep breathing so like what i like to explain too is like it's connected to our nervous system it's really um the only thing that activates your parasympathetic which again is that rest and digest so it's very neurological so um it's yeah slows your your heart rate, but also it like activates your, ooh, I'm going to say your, uh, forget there's something it activates, but it's your parasympathetic, um, in short. Um, and then just visual schedule that predictability, um, task analysis. So this is where I think OT's bread and butter really is. It's like looking at a task and then thinking about all those the other things, like the personal factors, um, motivators, all of that. And then just like, what is, the task and how can we achieve it and what's the barriers and how do we take that barrier out um environment so we're looking at the environment the just right challenge so i think sometimes again uh, or i think i think about like the trend of like the coloring book fad about how like oh like um and i'm not saying that we start putting coloring books in all the classrooms but it's just the idea that like giving an activity that is just right that regulates breathing right before you have them do this in crazy task, you know, that might be overwhelming. So like, let's just get them breathing normal and then we kind of challenge it. Um, and then that co-regulation, um, you know, in the schools year after year, that first month, everyone's coming to me, like they have sensory issues. I need help. I need help. Sensory, sensory, sensory. And I'm like, just give it, just give it a little bit more time because you need to develop that co-regulation. And then like within three months, like the student knows what's going to happen. They know their, who who they can go to, you know, so there's so much that can happen. So that's like the one thing that I always say that key is that co-regulation and then accommodations. So um, accommodations, I, I think about this a little bit for like, as like kind of like a hidden disability, right? Which when I'm, I'm educating my paras and my teachers, I, I think of it like, you, you know, if somebody's wearing glasses, I say, okay, so you're wearing glasses, but if you weren't wearing glasses, I would assume you can see but you have glasses that is accommodating your vision. So 
how can we accommodate some of these sensory um, sensory supports, you know, and we can, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but okay. What does predictability look like? Um, I just like this kind of visual. So it's no more than just a visual schedule. It can also be having that co-regulator, having um, a visual of like, first you're gonna write, then you're gonna color, and then you're gonna cut, you know, having sticks in there. Okay, this is it, this is the task, then you're done. So it's just kind of like knowing this is the end of the task or what's coming or how much time. So back to that kind of umbrella. Um, so this is the other part, and these are all kind of like intertwined, but this is that sensory processing, uh, sensory-based motor disorder. So it's that dyspraxia and that postural. Um, this really, I see a lot, but never gets brought to me. <laughs> and I always bring it to, you know, so. Um, so again, so dyspraxia is also a developmental coordination disorder. This does, this is diagnosed by a pediatrician with support usually of an OT or a PT. Um, so this can be that motor planning, which we'll talk about in the next slide, sequencing of actions, problem solving, difficulties with transition, emotional dysregulation. I think Diane already kind of said all this, so, but to recap, um, it's actually like five to 6% of, of uh, people are diagnosed, but really it's, I, I've read that it's vastly underdiagnosed. Um, postural disorder. So this is, again, having good awareness of where your posture is in space and like firing, like it's usually you're under responsive to where your posture, your core is, which is so important to like, you have to have good core to have good distal movements, like your hands and your gross motor, that bilateral coordination. Um, and so a lot of times I do see a lot of kids with fine motor difficulties, but it kind of comes back to that sensory processing piece. So how can we like support that? Because me just working on fine motor tasks day in and day out is not going to um, support, you know, what's happening neuro neurologically. Um, okay, so this is a lot of a slide. I'm going to kind of try to go through this briefly, but this is motor planning. Um, and again, there's like four points. So it's like that ideation of knowing what the task is. So um, I'll kind of give you an example. I had a student who the teacher asked to go wash his hands. And she had this beautiful visual that she tapped at, go wash your hands. And the student just sat there and she said it really nicely. She tapped, she gave him a visual, go wash your hands. And I knew the student and I knew the student had some difficulties with this motor planning, specifically this ideation. So I said, hey, hey, go stand up. And he immediately stood up because he could not kind of come up with that first step. And then I said, walk to the sink. And he went to the sink. And then he was able to kind of execute all of those plans, um, which is that sequencing. Once he got there, he could do it. Um, there were visual supports, but I don't know if he utilized those, but then he was executing it. And then it, and then the last step of motor planning is that adaption. So being able to do that in another setting. So I think this is like huge, which again, we accommodate through in the schools, but it's also kind of trial error. What is the support? What is the inputs that they need based on their sensory? Do they need auditory paired with modeling, you know, repetition? So, all right, I'm trying to buzz through these. All right, back to our umbrella, the last part of this, and again, they kind of all overlap, right, um, is that sensory discrimination, um, which Diane did a great job of just kind of talking about all those differences, you know, visual, this is maybe the student that can't really just dis, uh, dis, uh, discriminate between the P, lowercase P and the lowercase Q, right, um, or writing them. Auditorily, again, um, can't hear the difference between those words. Um, and you know, uh, uh, proprioception, they can't figure out how much pressure to put on a pencil, um, where to start, where, you know, where their wrist needs. I had one student, I always had to like, cue where his wrist needed to be, you know, but the teacher would always be like, oh, he needs hand strengthening, but I was just like, he just needs to rest his arm and then he's there. So it's kind of, that is part of this. All right. So sensory discrimination in disorder. This is overlapped with that modulation and the motor. Um, and it's the difficulty to, 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 to differentiate sensation um, and the intensity. Um, so you they need processing time. This also really plays into, again, that handwriting um, and the ability to play sports sometimes. You know, even just like standing in line and managing your personal space is that kind of awareness and that discrimination. 
um, visually finding stuff in a bag, in a room, on a shelf, and then just knowing where your body is in relation to other objects. So, um, so ways that we support this in school. So I like to put, and this is probably just the OT in me, but um, it really meaningful and interesting to the student will go a long way. So the more that we can find that interest and meaning to the student, we can build on and expand on that. Um, and sometimes, like even with like handwriting, if a student is not interested, then I just don't want to waste time time there. If he's already kind of figured out his own plan, then I I think that sometimes that is enough to kind of let's figure out like the next steps. Um, and then support and guide the student. So this is like with motor planning, um, it's really important for them to kind of be part of that motor, that um, that plant, that problem solving. So giving them that time and space and then kind of building on that. Um, accommodations, which you kind of mentioned. Um, so this could be like increasing um, input and seating. So again, when we think about that modulation or discrimination, just giving sometimes um, it's counterintuitive, but giving more support for that stability can also um, help with, uh, you know, feeling a sense of calm, giving more input, um, postural stability. So that's huge. Um, assistive technology and like word processing over handwriting, which sometimes um, can be hard to like kind of give up. But I think sometimes with sensory is like part of that umbrella that really does need to be supported um, differently. And then strength-based approach. So I had a student who, he was in second grade. Uh, he was still getting like hand over hand support, but I knew that he knew all the letters. So that is a strength. A strength is that he could identify all the letters. He could find them on a keyboard. He could essentially type. So I just wanted to think about that as like, that's a strength of him. So by kind of going to this to handwriting and doing a passive activity that wasn't supporting his sensory processing. Sometimes we have to really think about that in the school and how do we approach that to make it more strength based, um, which is kind of goes into that like access points. So. And then success. Honestly, the student was it's it's more meaningful for him to communicate and start writing than to try to do handwriting and passive or hand over hand. So. All right, how are we doing? Um, maybe I should five more minutes because you want to share some stuff. Okay, so um, I might skip this slide. Um, and I just like to kind of comment too a little bit, like sensory really is like one piece of the puzzle. Um, there's a lot of things that can also be coming, you know, at play to it. So, you know, sensory is like, again, how is our body um, internalized kind of some of, uh, you know, our body state and, and process all this information, but there are other things that can kind of heighten that fight or flight, trauma and stress, you know, lack of coping skills, um, tasks that does not match. So again, um, if we're, you know, when we talked, when we saw that, um, the, the, the triangle that Diane had where it's like cognitives way up top here, you know, and, but the student is still kind of developing some of that, um, uh, you know, that sensory processing, then it, then it can be also kind of, um, it's it challenging for them to, to kind of process, um, communication, um, executive functioning and classroom environment. So that's kind of all of those pieces that can also, um, play into, to a, a person's sensory profile. Um, I see this a lot. Is it sensory or behavior? And I just wanted to comment that all sensory processing difficulties are observable behaviors and that sensory is a biological and neurological need and it cannot be controlled. Um, and, and these are beha um, th these behaviors. So I encourage my teachers and myself, you know, to really chase the why behind the behavior. Um, is the task too challenging? Have we built rapport? Have we kind of done all these things? Or what is the need for this? Is it like that student needs to find where his body is in space? Um, and that sensory integrations techniques are not com uh, compatible with behavior approaches, so like token boards, um, rewards, punishment. Um, and at the end of the day, kids do well when they can. And I believe that so that when we give them the right supports, they want to do well. 
Um, so this is something I kind of made. Um, so in the, in the center of it is that what we are striving for in the classroom, um, in the school, in education is that accent is that access point and also that active, like active participation. So we want our students to be included, to participate, to want to be at school and to learn. And these are kind of all those pieces that I think really do build on that, 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 that core in the middle. So it's the relationship, right? Are they include in, are they included, but do they have that co-regulator? Do they have that person? The personal factors that is that sensory profile. Um, there, you know, and then the, the meaning and purposeful activities. So that's also kind of part of that. Um, and then within all of those really does build that like access and that participation piece. And, um, and this slide, I kind of just the takeaway is, um, you know, sensory, it's, it's not fixable. We are really accommodating and supporting, um, the individual. So this isn't something that we can fix neurology. We can we can support it through coping strategies and like education and accommodations, um, but this isn't something that we can like go and kind of like fix their nervous system. We all we all have these. Uh, we all have our own sensory pro, you know profile and um, processing. So I think um, yeah. And then just the possible outcomes for supporting students is less aggression and trauma responses, improved regulation and engagement through this, you know, this is when learning um, happens. And then um, improved attention and class participation, improved play skills and motor skills, increased independence and a sense of belonging and safety at school. So those are kind of these output, these are, you know, the overall, um, you know, outcomes that we want for our students. So. I think that's all I got. <laughs> yeah, why don't you? And I'm gonna come and have some of the benefits of being ancient here. Um, so if you are uh, at home right now, um, please make sure to drop your email in the chat if you would like these materials sent to you. I see some of you doing that now. Also, please make sure to. Um, fill out our feedback form. Um, Diane actually brought some sensory tools here today. Are you going to talk about them or just allow people to? I can do both. Cool. Might be good. Yeah. So better. I'm going to kind of yeah turn okay. the camera here. Um, okay. And while Jen's presenting, again, if you have, or, can I call you Jen? Diane. <laughs> Diane's presenting. There's a Jen in the chat that I was just responding to. That's why my <laughs> brain. It's late in the day. Um, if you have questions, please drop them in the chat, and I will make sure to help you get them. We do. that uh, like the more, uh, hands were like the more disturbing mm -hmm. and you know we were all just like oh oh but I don't know that anybody in that team had an idea other than his point chart you know which I know isn't going to help him right. I did point it out so I'm just wondering See, is he auditorially sensitive yeah I mean I would say like any any yeah, if the more movement, the more activity, the more sounds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so like I said earlier, sometimes kiddos can, or anyone can, they use their own verbal as a way to drown out the, the piece that they're not liking. Um, also, sometimes I've seen uh, people use verbal stims as a way to regulate themselves, right? So anything with a lot of rhythm, that could be a piece of it too. Um, as rhythm is very regulating, so I don't know what the chirping sounds like, but if there's a rhythm piece to component, it could also just be that, if that helps. Um, also, our mouth, if you think about when we're a baby and like a sucking is very regulating, so sometimes you'll see people do like verbal stims of their mouth, but it's, again, it's a regulating piece for them. So have they tried any kind of like, you know, okay. earplugs or? She knows that you know, escalated, so they all go into the special room off to the side for a while. Um, but not, I mean, I don't know that they've got an intervention that keeps them in the classroom. 
not or like noise canceling headphones or yeah he did those when he was little or they have um they have a bunch of new ones out for so the neurodiverse community or, right now yeah they but they have a i mean you know i have apple uh gave me my brain right now but i have them airpods work great but also there's um two companies out called loop and blair and they're meant for they geared towards the neurodiverse community and they're small um so they're not like super you know they're being worn everywhere and there's actually quizzes on their websites where you can be like i need your plugs for this uh and they're kind of tailored for different things oh. so yeah um if that's what, what, what? there's loop is loop. one l-o-o-p and then flare audio they make one called calmer or calm that um and both are kind of um up and coming in neurodiverse community one of them is has they found is really actually really good for tinnitus and that was kind of a a false uh, i mean they weren't expecting that to happen but they found it in their research um i think we have a question sure. in the chat to At atlas hi there um i'm actually not able to write in the chat it says it's disabled for me i don't know Ooh. um she was one of the Oh, great. Thank you for letting me know. Um, if anyone else is having the same problem, what I'll do is um, I'll share my email on the screen here in a moment, and then you can um, email me your email address. OK, thanks. Um, my uh -huh. question was, is the presentation going to be available afterwards, like for reference? Yes, it will. Um, and if you send me your email address, I will make sure you get it. Thank you. Let everybody know that this exists. This is at Walmart. It's under 40 bucks. Uh, and it's an Ozark hammock chair. So you can also get it online. Um, but you know, for a lot of homes, right? I know getting an actual swing installed in your house is not feasible. <laughs> so this is just a really great um kind of I just feel like everyone that has sensory issues should know it exists. <laughs> so it's a rocking chair, but again, it's kind of like a hammock style. Um I'll get in it, uh, but basically, and it's portable too, right? So you can take it when you travel, you can, you know, things like that. Um, so, you know, I'll have kids get wrapped themselves in it, but on top of the linear input, which is, you know, the rocking piece, again, there's a rhythm to it, super regulating, but you're also getting proprioceptive input because you're getting basically your body kind of covered with the hammock piece of it. You can get more appropriate, proprioceptive input by putting a bunch of squishy pillows or switch mellows in it. So this is um, really great. The only thing I tell people to wear out is if you have a huge seeker, you can, you know, you can get this super tippy. Um, so maybe it's something you want to get and like just be sitting next to it while they're in it and rocking in it so that they don't get super tippy. But um, overall, it's it's pretty solid for 40 bucks, all I have to say. <laughs> well, sometimes I think like, um, when I talk about just like calming linear movements, I think about like, or and, and also that switch, I think about like a baby, like you swallow a baby, you rock them, yes. you're not putting them on a like a rosy, you know, like lunch themselves. Yeah, I think if we thought about what we did for infants for calming for the just general population and never got away from that, we as a society would probably be in a lot better space. <laughs> but, but for, you know, so that's like the sucking piece is super calming, the, the flexion, the, the swaddling piece, the rocking, right? vibration, because some kids really like that car ride with all people. So, uh, vibration tool, like real easy, these little mini massagers. These can be really great for under responsive kiddos, um, but can, vibration is also a really calming kind of tactile input. So there's this one, and it just looks like a ice cream cone. People think are cute. And then this one is like this little, um, the little bug. It's actually a toy. I always forget what this is called. It's called a hex bug. Um, so it's made for like preschool kids as a toy, but it's actually like a great little vibration and can fit in a pocket. And the vibration isn't too loud, which is kind of nice about it. Um, when I worked in schools, I had a couple of kiddos that would use this and it was, you know, it wasn't too distracting for other kids in the classroom. And then um, Lycra is great. You can go to the fabric store and buy this. This is a Lycra tunnel. This is a really long Lycra tunnel, but basically you can have them crawl through it. And because the fabric's stretchy, they get kind of that heavy work into their muscles and joints. 
you can have them push things through it. Like I'm like, let's find the biggest stuffed animal you have, or let's take a giant pillow and push through. So that's a really great tool. Um, I got this off of Etsy, but again, I didn't feel like sewing, but if you, if you can sew, it's really simple to make a tunnel. And then this one you've probably seen is called a body sock. So again, same fabric lycra, um, but it's great just for a lot of proprioceptive inputs. Um, can cut out the visual for kids, right? So they can go in it, um, deep, you know, kind of go inside if they want, um, get into that flexion pose. Um, and then other things I just love are, this one is not my scented putty, but I have scented lavender putty. Um, so I love that for calming, but this is kind of my favorite brand. They make the lavender one too. Uh, so this step is, what is this? I think they're called interactive, but this is my favorite because it's not super sticky. I don't know if you guys have ever bought putty online through Amazon or whatever, but sometimes it's really gross and sticky, and so your tactically defensive kids can't stand it. This stuff's pretty good, and I guess that the lavender one's my favorite. Um, and then this is also just kind of a real simple fidget that, like, you know, isn't visually distracting because that's the thing about fidgets in school, which I'm sure you can attest to, is. Sometimes they can be really visually distracting to them. So you want something that like feels good. They can move their hands and get some energy out, but they're not gonna be like this or like, you know, maybe in front of their friend's face because it's so cool. So this one is a really nice one because it's kind of small and quiet, but still get some of that fidgeting out. And then this I just got, and it, I'm not gonna lie, it's kind of expensive, but it's all. <laughs> so they're like little magnetic rocks. Um, but again, just. This is not one that maybe is a great school one, might be a better home fidget um, because of the noise, right? And they can kind of fall all over the place. But um, if some people really don't like putty and they really like that smooth texture. So this one is kind of nice uh, for that piece. And again, if you guys want to come up and look at all this stuff, you're welcome to. This is just a body check green. So again, I'll show you. Like this, this one is for skin. So it has cold skin, warm skin, itchy skin, goosebumps, sweat, dry, messy, clean, tickly, sweaty, sore. So again, it gives them a really nice visual for each and then also has the word on it. So you can use it for a lot of different types of learners. Um, okay. Any other questions or? Yes. So on one slide that you said, on one slide that you said, your discussion on that in children to show effort connectivity. When adulthood, there's low connectivity and there may be a shift happen. Can you explain things more, like some example details? Yeah, they so you know, grow up and the, the reason why it changed, it definitely get better. So it can go both ways. I know there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that kind of go behind that. So um, yes, yeah, so sometimes people can, we have enough modifications and accommodations that the sensory stuff that really bothered them as a child, they figured out how to kind of implement, like, maybe they exercise every day, or like you were saying, maybe they're ultra marathoners. So they that's kind of a way they've accommodated to learn, uh, to get that homey input that they need. Um, one thing I, my favorite saying is, when in doubt, probe it out. So what that means is, when in doubt, proprioception is our most calming sense. So get in there, give them some, you know, you know, have them swallow themselves, uh, roll a therapy ball over them, or just get in a tight space where they can be squeezed, because um, that's very uh, stabilizing to your, to your body. But going back to that piece, you know, some, some, so yes, you can change over time both ways, right? I've had other people that maybe didn't have huge sensory issues, and then an adult had a, had a trauma. And so trauma can also cause pretty significant sensory processing issues. Um, so that 